Yo, let's talk red cameras. Hashtag research. Hello, Anthony Serratelli here of Jersey Filmmaker and welcome to another episode of my Road to Red series where I'll be documenting my full experience owning a red cinema camera. Today I want to go over some of the important things I've learned while researching red cameras, some of the variations between the models and which one I might buy. So the first thing I want to talk about are reds camera bodies and sensors. So here's a list of how the bodies and sensors have developed over the years. The very first red was the red one. The red one had a mysterium sensor. So the one was the body, the mysterium was the sensor. Then they made a new sensor for the red one called the mysterium X. So they called it the MX. So it was the red one with an MX sensor. Then they made their first body upgrade, which they called DSMC, digital still and motion camera body. The first DSMC they came out with, I believe was the Epic X. They called it the Epic X. So it's the red Epic body. And then they put the X after, I believe relating to the MX sensor that they kept from the red one. Then they came out with the Scarlet X, which was like a little sister to the Epic, also having the MX sensor. Then they came out with the Epic Dragon, upgrading the sensor from MX to Dragon. So the red Epic Dragon with a Dragon sensor. I don't know why they didn't call it like the Epic D, but they called it the Epic Dragon. Then they came out with the red Scarlet Dragon. Again, the baby sister with the same Dragon sensor, the red Scarlet Dragon. Then they upgraded the body for the second time to the DSMC2. They came out with the weapon body, which is a 6K camera, also supporting the Dragon sensor. Then they came out with another Scarlet and they called it the Scarlet W, still with the Dragon sensor. Then they came out with an even babier brother, the Red Raven, also having the Dragon sensor. Then they released the Epic W, which was now a new sensor, the Helium sensor, an 8K sensor. The Epic W 8K Super 35 body is also a DSMC2 body. Then they released the Weapon 8K Super 35 Helium Sensor. So the Weapon body with the Helium Sensor. Then there's also a Weapon 8K VistaVision body with a Dragon Sensor, which I believe is more of a full frame sensor compared to the Super 35 of the Epic W and the Weapon 8K. So now let's take a look at this nifty little pamphlet I got one day in the Red Store in New York. On the last page is a nice layout of the specs of their current cameras. So looking at this, there's a lot of numbers. You can see up top is listed the Raven, Scarlet, Epic, Weapon, 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 which are all the bodies that they currently have. And then the sensor right below it are all Dragons or Heliums. I wanna talk about the 8K Helium sensor on the Epic and the Weapon. The prices are quite different, yet the specs are not that different. So I really wanna dive into that. If you look here, both cameras have a Helium sensor. Same effective pixels, same sensor size, and same dynamic range. The max data rates vary a little bit, which does help when you're trying to record raw formats and ProRes proxies, let's say. It gives you a little more speed to be able to push out all of those files. The biggest difference is in the max frame rates. At 8K on the weapon, you can shoot up to 60 frames a second, where on the Epic, you can only shoot up to 30 frames per second. And same thing when you move down to 7K, you can only do at 30 frames per second, whereas on the weapon, 60 to 75 frames per second. From 6K down, they're exactly the same as far as max data rates. The red code compression settings, you can get a little bit lower at 8K full frame on the weapon at 24 frames per second. And obviously they offer a 60 frames per second, which the Epic does not. But those file sizes will be enormous. Keep that in mind. The acquisition formats are all exactly the same. The Apple ProRes options are also exactly the same. And although written funny in this diagram, the Avid DNX HR or DNX HD are also exactly the same. So after researching and trying to figure out like, is that really the only difference? Because the difference in price is $15,000. $15,000 just to be able to shoot up to 60 frames at 8K. I'd rather just drop to 6K to do it. However, on the Helium sensor, dropping down to 7K, 6K, or any other frame size does crop in on the sensor. So you're gonna lose some low light capabilities. If you have a nicely framed shot and you wanna bump up the frame rate, you can't just put it in that high frame rate mode. You have to back it up or get a new lens to frame it the same. That doesn't bother me too much. I know what I'm getting into in that situation. I'm gonna have to just plan around it. But the Raven, for example, at four and a half K can shoot anywhere from 24 to 120 frames per second without any cropping. You don't have to reframe anything. If you wanna bump it up to 120 frames, you can do that. Same lens, same distance, everything works nicely. Here's my dilemma with which camera I wanna buy. Of course I want an 8K camera, right? If you get a helium sensor and you get 8K resolution, future-proofing, 
I would be very excited to shoot at 8K, edit in 4K, and I deliver at 1080. 10 years from now, when they're like, oh man, this is still so beautiful, but it's in HD and everything's in 4K now on TV, oh, guess what? I still have that. I can export now a 4K copy. Similar to how I do now, shooting in 4K, I have a 1080 copy, but I'd have to re-edit and reframe everything at 4K. I don't edit in 4K, but I would really like to do that for the future. RED is obviously known for their image quality. 8K resolution's insane, 6K resolution's insane. They shoot Hollywood movies on these cameras. I mean, how could you not want to shoot on these cameras? One of the things that might sway me to getting a lower I don't want to say a lower end camera, but a smaller size sensor at the moment is that their sensors are upgradable. If I do buy the Scarlett or I do buy the Weapon 6K, I can always upgrade to the 8K sensor. It does cost money, obviously, but you don't have to buy a whole new camera. These cameras are almost future proof. Most cameras I'd say on the average maybe last about five years nowadays. They just get outdated, new things come out, 4K, 6K, 8K, they'll probably be 12K soon, 16K, who knows? But with RED, you can upgrade this amazing camera to keep up with the time. So this is a camera I plan to have for 15 plus years. RED's raw capabilities with their RED code settings and their proprietary R3D files are the most usable out of any raw files out there. I'm not saying that they're not huge files, which they are, but they seem to be the most compatible with things like Premiere, which I prefer to edit in. So I'm very excited that it's a usable raw format so I can then do all that I wanna to do to a raw uncompressed image in post. The ergonomics of this camera are unbelievable. It's a small little box. It's very capable of getting on gimbals and drones and handheld, it's, it's, it's a heavy little piece so it gives you a really nice handheld feel. And then obviously it can be rigged out and you can make it as big as you wanna be and have all the bells and whistles and that's a lot of fun to do too. And then one of my favorite things that RED offers is the community and support. When you buy a RED, it feels like you automatically become part of this family. I've talked to people that have RED cameras and I'm like, oh, I'm buying a RED camera. And then we automatically connect and it's just like this whole geeky thing that we get going and we start talking about the cameras and it's just like we instantly are friends. But they do host events and anytime I've had questions and called them, they've been so helpful. So it's a very, very nice community, very supportive of each other. They're very supportive with actual technology and helping support center, customer care, whatever you wanna call it. I very much enjoy that if I'm gonna be spending that kind of money that I have that available to me. Okay, a couple cons. File sizes, of course. File sizes when you're shooting at 8K or 6K or anything are gonna be large. You're shooting at RAW, they're gonna be large. You're gonna need a lot of storage. Hopefully if you're shooting for clients, they're paying for it. So that in turn will cause for a longer workflow. You're gonna need a boss dog system to keep your files running in real time or you're gonna have to downsize the resolution to a quarter uh, to be able to play them through smoothly. But when you start adding color correction and all this stuff, like the files just get big and it gets hard to work with. So be aware before buying. Audio inputs, pretty much none. I think there's an eighth inch jack input to help capture scratch audio, but it's not usable for anything in post. I'm honestly not even sure exactly what the input is because I know there's no XLRs, so I don't even think about it. I know I'm gonna be recording externally if I need it. Otherwise, it's great for music videos or commercials with voiceover, things like that. No internal NDs. I've been spoiled with my Sony cameras or Canon cameras that have internal ND filters which are amazing. You don't have to put a matte box on and sliding filters in and out. You can just turn the little knob and all of a sudden you got your ND on there. It's an amazing feature to have and RED doesn't have it. I pray that they incorporate this someday, maybe on their DSMC3, but for now they don't have them, but there is a fix and it's gonna cost you about three grand. They do have what's called the DSMC RED motion mount which is just another mount, like a PL mount or an EF mount, which has an internal ND on it. So it goes in front of the sensor, there's an ND, then your lens goes on. And you can adjust it through the screen, I believe, or there's a little knob somewhere, and you can then have an internal ND on your camera. However, it does take your exposure down, I believe a third or two thirds of a stop. I, I forget exactly, I have to look into that, don't quote me, but it does take your exposure down from the get-go, no matter what, once you put that on there. So it's not something you might wanna keep on the camera at all times. It's something you're gonna wanna put on when you're maybe just shooting outside. So $3,000 to put it on front of the camera only when you need it, or you're buying Lee ND filters, which are thousands of dollars anyways. So it's not a bad option, just beware. It's not something you're gonna be using in all situations, so you really don't wanna have that on inside. 
So it's something you'll have to switch out here and there. It isn't just an internal ND. It's kind of an external internal ND, if that makes any sense. So look, there are a million things to think about when buying a RED camera, when spending anywhere from 10 to $70,000 or more if you're getting the Vista Vision. You wanna buy something you can make your investment back on. This is a professional decision usually. I personally like to go with the biggest and best thing there is, but this is not a situation that I'm just gonna go blow all this money on just to have the coolest, newest thing. So as for which one I wanna buy, I haven't really made my decision yet. I have an idea, but I do wanna do a little bit more research and talk it through a little bit more. You guys will hear what I'm thinking before I make that decision and that'll be happening soon. So that's all for now. There's plenty more to talk about and I will in future episodes, but if you like this episode, click the like button, click the subscribe to get alerts to future episodes, subscribe to my social medias at Jersey Filmmaker. If you have any comments or questions regarding anything I said today, please list it in the comments below. I plan to get back to everyone I possibly can. I wanna help you learn, please help me learn. Let's get it all right so when working with cameras that are this expensive, we know what we're doing and we can get the best possible quality images out of it that we can. Once again, I'm Anthony Serratelli of Jersey Filmmaker. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you next time.